Paul wrote to a number of churches in the Roman province of Galatia, and the subject of chapter 5, Paul wants to tell them to be free. They are Christians, they are free, they should live as though they are free. Terry Waite was an envoy from the Church of England, and he went to Lebanon in 1987 to secure the releases, and they took him hostage. And he was chained to a wall, and he was only allowed to go to the bathroom once a day. He was a hostage for 1,763 days, which is almost five years. And he was shackled to a radiator for four of those years. We can only imagine what he went through. And when he was released, we can only imagine the sense of freedom that he felt. But imagine that after his release, he's walking by the building where he had been held for those almost five years, and one of his captains calls him over. Come over here. Won't you come back to captivity? We will give you a new set of handcuffs, a new chain, a new room, and a new radiator to be chained to. Don't you think that would be rather silly? That's ridiculous. Why would Terry go back? No, of course he wouldn't go back. Would you go back to that kind of slavery once again? Now, why would I ask such a question? The reason I bring this illustration up is because that is what the people that Paul writes to in Galatians, that's what they were doing. They were leaving their freedom and going back into slavery. And he is urging them to be free. Be free like you were when you became Christians. You were set free. Why are you going back to the Old Testament, the laws and the rules and the res uh, resolutions and, and regulations? And so they have become hostages once again. Legalism attempts to do the impossible. They wanted to go back to legalism in order to change their old nature and make it to obey the laws of God. True spirituality to free us and make us more like Christ. The legalist says, if I just obey the rules, I will become a more spiritual person. I believe that I have the strength to do it. I can do what I'm told to do and I can measure up to the standards that are set before me. I want to do it on my own power. The spiritual person says, I have been set free. I have been set free from Jesus Christ and I'm no longer under bondage to sin. I'm no, under, under, no longer under bondage to the law. But I need something. I need someone to control my life from within me. And that someone is the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul is trying to get across to the Galatians. I want to point out that Paul is writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. He's not evangelizing pagans or the unsaved. He's talking to Christians. And he's going to tell us in this chapter two major things, and that becomes my twofold outline. True spirituality is a life of freedom and liberty. And the other thing he's going to emphasize is true spirituality is a life controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the first of those. Live a life of freedom, he's telling these Galatians, and by extension, he's telling us the same thing. He's telling Christians today, live a life of freedom. Be as free as God wants to make you. Verse 1 is the theme. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. 
Stand therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That's his theme. Why did Jesus die for us? He died to set us free. Free from our sin, free from our rebellion, free from the fears that we develop in our lives, free from bad habits, free from guilt and hate and bondage of this and that. Live in your freedom. Don't have a relapse. And that's what the Galatians were doing. They were having a relapse back into the old way of living under the law. As a Christian, you have true liberty. The law and grace do not mix. They're like oil and water. You can't mix law and grace. So imagine somebody giving a testimony for Benadryl. After six Benadryl tablets, I feel great. Of course, I also made up my own formula and I took it along with the Benadryl. Now what do you do with that testimony? Is that testimony worthy of a commercial? No, because you don't know if it was the Benadryl or the, the extra potion the, own, the extra formula that did the job. The testimony then is of no value. And this is what Paul is saying of the Galatians. They are mixing the two. They say they have freedom in Jesus, but they are also living by the law. Which one is doing the job? Is it the homemade remedy that is the cure? The legalist good works might be the cure. And so... That's not a good testimony. It's not a good way to live, Paul says. God gets little glory if I say, I'm justified by what the Lord has done and also by my own formula for life, which I follow. They can't both be true. The gospel of liberty is opposed to two tendencies, two yokes of slavery legalism and license. There are two groups of Christians. Those who want to live by the list of the taboos, the rules, the regulations, the do's and the don'ts, and those who want to react to that and say, let's do away with all taboos. Let's live just in our liberty. And so in the first 12 verses, Paul is going to deal with Christian liberty that is opposed to legalism. Let's read these verses together. First 12 verses. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is bound to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, for you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail but faith working through love. I would like to point out at this point that Paul mentions uh, faith, hope, and love in every letter that he writes. And here it is in this passage. He mentions faith, hope, and love. Continuing on in verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who called you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. And he who is troubling you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But if I, brethren, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the stumbling block of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would mutilate themselves. 
That is strong talk from the Apostle Paul. And in the original language, it's even stronger than they render it in English. Paul is really perturbed at this point. I must point out that the word legalism is not in the Bible. But the idea sure is, trying to live by the law is legalism. Paul mentions in verse 4, trying to be justified by the law. That's legalism. Preoccupation with the rules and the regulations and the downplaying of the intent of the law. Forgetting what the law is really about and emphasizing just the rules and the regulations. That's legalism. And so we might define legalism by saying legalism is Jesus plus human works. Jesus plus human works, plus human standards, plus human achievements. All of that is legalism. Paul's illustration of legalism is circumcision. That's what he comes down on. That's where he focuses because they were making an issue of circumcision among the Galatians. And so he focuses on that in verse 2. And he says, they have made circumcision their badge. It's their entry point into the kingdom. And that's not good. He has already mentioned their observation of the seasons. He says, you observe days and months and years and you look at your calendar and you run your church life by your calendar and you think that's going to get you into heaven. That's legalism. What are some legalisms that we contend with today? Well, maybe it's not the same things that Paul is aiming at in chapter 5, but we could sure list a lot of them. Church membership. Some people think church membership is going to give them an in into heaven. Or helping old people, particularly in this COVID virus situation where old people are supposed to stay in and younger people are helping the older people, but that's not going to get you brownie points into heaven. Or witnessing door to door. Some people do it out of duty instead of out of love. Or observing certain diets like eating fish on Friday. Or making resolutions like New Year's resolutions. This year I'm going to live for the Lord. I am, I am, I am. Good intentions aren't going to do the job. And if we see Christianity as a duty, we are into legalism. We are not in bondage to do any of these things. Not for our salvation. If you think that salvation is made more secure by any of these things, that you are then into legalism. Same goes for baptism. If you get baptized just to make it into heaven, you are into legalism. Or tithing. Or serving in the church. These are just more badges that you can pin on your chest when you get to heaven's gate and say, I deserve to get into heaven. Look at these. Rather, in verses 5 and 6, Paul says, it's faith working through love. Those are the two big words in the chapter. Faith working through love. It's like the difference between an employee and a mother. Employees work by laws and rules and regulations. They must be on the job at 8 o'clock. They have lunch between uh, 12 and 1, and then they're off at, say, 5 o'clock. And they deserve their wages. They've earned it. They get their wages. They get sick leave. They get other friends' benefits. And no one can expect more. Compare that to a mother who doesn't work for wages and has no agreement concerning hours or pay. Her duties are not outlined, they're not spelled out. She knows nothing of punching a clock, she never goes on strike, but she gives her unceasing, willing devotion to her home and her family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. She takes care of the kids, she humors the old man, she does housework. And she gets tired, but love keeps her going. 
where employees drag their feet if told to do a little overtime, she's a member of the family. And she doesn't know what overtime means. It is love that motivates her. Because of love, there is no place for rules and regulations and commandments. She goes far beyond that. She's in the family of God. That's the way Christians should be in the family of God. The true believer is under the law of love and liberty and goes far beyond what the law can require. Can you imagine a mother wanting to put on a, be put on the servant's payroll with rules and regulations and hours of service and set wages? Some Christians want to do that very thing. They want to go back from their liberty back into rules and regulations and so they can earn their way for God. And so the first thing that Paul opposes <clears throat> is legalism in verses 1 through 12. The second thing he opposes is license in verses 13 through 15. So let's read this together. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not let your freedom be used as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. So here is the opposite danger. One group of Christians wants uh, to go into legalism. There's another group of Christians who oppose license uh, liberty opposes license and they want to be free they want to use license so this is the opposite danger Christian liberty is not a pretext for doing whatever you want to do the US Constitution promises us liberty but that does not give us liberty or license to break its laws imagine a family that wants to be free each member of the family eats his meals or her meals whenever they feel like it. Father comes home whenever it suits him. The son drives off with the family car and the daughter invites her fiance home for the weekend without checking with the family and without getting permission. Can you imagine the chaos in such a family who all insist on their liberty and their freedom? Everybody is free, but they're all miserable. Christian freedom is not freedom to indulge the flesh. Paul tells us in verse 13, it is not freedom to indulge the flesh. We are free from sin, not to sin. A new Christian was teased because he couldn't have fun anymore. Isn't that the idea that many non-Christians have? You become a Christian, you have to give up all your fun. And he says, oh no, I can do anything I want to do. I can carouse, I can swear, I can go to dirty movies, anytime I want to. Oh, they lit up, is that right? Yeah. I can do anything I want, but I don't want to do those things. God gave me a different want to when the Holy Spirit came into my life. Christian freedom is not freedom to indulge the flesh. Christian freedom is not freedom to exploit our neighbor either. In verses 14 and 15. If we disregard this, we return to Christian cannibalism we are told to love one another and serve one another and if we don't do that we turn back into cannibals just look at our politicians today are they loving one another 
This is the acid test. Live, Christian liberty is not freedom to indulge the flesh, but to control the flesh. It's not freedom to exploit the neighbor. It is freedom to serve the neighbor. It is not freedom to disregard the law. It is freedom to fulfill the law, which is love, the law of love. And so Paul is urging in this first section of chapter 5, be one who lives a life of freedom, true Christian freedom. And then he moves on to the second half of the chapter, verses 16 through 26. Live a life controlled by the Holy Spirit. This will prevent the relapse into legalism. D.L. Moody had a, an illustration where he pulled a glass out from under the pulpit and he asked the congregation, how can I get all the air out of this glass? Someone suggested, well, suction. Get a vacuum pump and suck the air out. And Moody pointed out, well, you'll have to continually have to have vacuum in order to do that. And then he pulled a pitcher of water from under the pulpit and he poured water into the glass and he said, there, now the air is out. In the Christian life, freedom is not sucking sin out of our life, but being filled by the Holy Spirit so that there is no room in our life for sin. The fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life brings us freedom. Christians must learn how to allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives and do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Sometimes we just can't cook up any love for someone or some situation. It just doesn't come. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and the Spirit can give us that love. An 180 pound man steps into an elevator and the law of gravity does not cease because when the man steps into this little cubicle suspended by cables over a, a cavity, law of gravity still works. He still weighs 180 pounds. The elevator goes up when he presses the button. The law of gravity is still in force but now it is overcome by another power. The man does not aid the elevator by trying to go up. His grunting and groaning and wishing and thinking doesn't make the elevator go up. And neither does that make the fruit of the Spirit appear in our lives. We allow the Spirit to work and grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And so the man just relaxes in the elevator and he lets the elevator do the work. We Christians need to relax and let the Holy Spirit work in our lives and work the fruit out in our lives as only He can and as only He will. In verse 16, Paul says, walk by the Holy Spirit. Walking by the Spirit is one step at a time. It's a slow, tedious product, uh, process. One step at a time. Walk, 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 step, step. Step. Knock knee girl had trouble walking until one knee said to the other, if you let me buy this time, I'll let you buy next time. Walking is a continuous process. In verse 16, it is a present tense and Paul implies that this walking goes on for a lifetime. In verses 16 through 21, he says, walking in the Spirit protects us against the work of the flesh. Let's read verses 16 through 21. But I say, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other 
to prevent you from doing what you would. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are plain. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. In other words, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other things just like them. So in verses 16 through 21, Paul is telling us that the Spirit protects us against the works of the flesh. The works are listed here and they result in weariness and frustration and faintness and exhaustion and burnout as we have uh, these things operating in our life. Strife and jealousy and anger and all those things. They just wear us out. And the flesh, he mentions, uh, the New International, or New English Version translates that our lower nature. The flesh is our lower nature. The flesh is humanism. It is human achievement. So in verse 16, Paul makes the statement it's really not a command. It comes through as a command in this translation. I say walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's a command, but it's really not a command. It is a statement. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The two are opposed to each other. Their oil and their water, they won't mix. In verse 17, he says, the spirit and the flesh war against each other. The Holy Spirit protects against the works of the flesh. In verses 22 through 26, he says, the spirit produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's read verses 22 through 26. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us have no self-conceit, no provoking of one another, no envy of one another. The fruit of the Spirit, as Keith and Debbie sang moments ago, they are more important than the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some are given this gift, some are given that gift. You know, they're gifts of teaching and prophecy and helping and all kinds of gifts. The gift of the, of the fruit of the Spirit is more important than those gifts. The fruit of the Spirit cannot be counterfeited. You cannot counterfeit love, for example. You cannot counterfeit true joy or patience or kindness or goodness. They just come through naturally and you can see them for what they are. So the fruit of the Spirit is more important than the gifts of the Spirit. We are not to judge each other, but we can be fruit inspectors. We can look for these gifts of the, or fruit of the Spirit in our lives and in other people's lives. The Holy Spirit is like a seed that is planted in a believer's heart. If it is nourished, it will grow into a fruitful tree bearing beautiful fruit. I don't know if you've ever been into a fruit orchard or not, but if you go into, a, say, a, a peach orchard, you don't hear the, the trees grunting and groaning to produce the fruit. The fruit just naturally grows, just silently, slowly, but it keeps on growing. And what does the fruit look like? It looks like what Paul labels here, fruit, joy, peace. It looks like Jesus. 
The fruit of the Spirit makes us look like Jesus. How healthy is your fruit tree? The legalist tries to do the opposite. The legalist wants to start with the fruit. They love the things that they see. They love joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, and all those things. But they start with that. It's like starting with an apple and then getting a tree and placing it under the apple to support the apple and then getting some roots so that the tree can stand up and it's going about it backwards. And that's what the legalist does. He wants to start with the mature fruit. The Christian starts with the seed, which is the Holy Spirit. And verse 16 says, walk by the Spirit. Listen to Paul's plea in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Day in, day out, day by day, step by step. Because walking implies a goal. When you walk somewhere, you have somewhere to go. It's a goal. And our walk in the Christian life is to be Christ-like. Walking is also a process, one step at a time. And it's a healthy activity. We turn away from things of the flesh and toward the things of the Holy Spirit. Our old nature was like a pig. A pig loves to roll in the mud. He loves to wallow in it. And he looks for something unclean. And if you are around pigs, they'll get out of the mud and they'll stand in the sun and the mud dries on them and they have a caked mud outer exterior. Pigs love it. Our new nature does not love to be unclean. Our new nature is like a sheep which yearns for what is clean. Those who are living in the Spirit, enjoying the fruit of the Spirit, yearn for what is clean. A life controlled by the Holy Spirit is winning the war between the old nature and the new nature. We're becoming more and more Christ-like as we allow the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our lives. And so the spiritual Christian is free. Not free to sin. No, he is empowered by the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Let me summarize. Legalism is faith plus works. A legalist seeks to be right with God by rules and regulations. There's something comfortable about reducing Christianity to a list of do's and don'ts and regulations, whether your list comes from mindless fundamentalism or mindless liberalism. You always know where you stand and this helps reduce anxiety. Do's and don'tism has the advantage that you don't need wisdom. You don't have to think subtly to make hard choices. You don't have to relate personally to a demanding and loving God because you're doing things your way. Charles Swindoll says, Rigidity is the trademark of legalism, the arch enemy of any church on the move. Let legalism have enough rope, and there will be a lynching of all new ideas, fresh thinking, and innovative programs. We've never done it that way before. And then there are those who live their life by license. License is faith with an absence of works. It's the opposite extreme to legalism. The legalist, or I mean the one under license says, I am free in Christ, therefore I can do whatever I please. The Christian who falls into license may think that he can indulge in sin, because his eternal salvation can't be lost or because he is forgiven or already or because at least he rationalizes God will forgive me. 
When Paul was writing to the Romans, he said, shall I sin some more so that grace can abound all the more? The more sin, the more grace. What a deal. That's the one under license. And Paul recoils against that by saying, God forbid. If we died to sin, how can we still sin? And the third person lives his life in liberty. Liberty is faith demonstrated by works. It is freedom to enjoy a relationship with God that once denied uh, sin. It did, just denied that there was such a thing as sin. But then in Christ, I am free to live without condemnation of the past sin, of fear of the future. God does not wipe away my sin, give me salvation, and then put on handcuffs to hinder my Christian life. Such handcuffs are self-imposed. I am free from my past. God has wiped it clean. It is no longer imprisoning me. My debts have been paid. Why would you go back to legalism, Paul asks the Galatians. Why would you put on the burden that God has removed? He is asking Christians today. Some people need to accept God's grace, God's forgiveness. And so if there is anyone listening today who has not accepted Christ, that's where you begin. You begin by accepting God's uh, grace and forgiveness and freedom. But Paul is talking basically to Christians in chapter 5. And some people need to repent. And some people who have repented need to take off those self-imposed handcuffs and live in their freedom. Put off the handcuffs of memories. True spirituality is like a, a marriage where the husband and the wife serve each other out of a sense of love and union. Life in the flesh, legalism, is like a marriage being destroyed by the spirit of legalism and license where husband and wife live with each other out of a sense of duty. And they are constantly bickering and getting at each other. A spiritual man or a spiritual woman is like a child who does not boast of himself but rather boasts of his parents. We are children of God and we make our boast in the Lord. The theme of chapter 5 is where the spirit is of the Lord is, there is freedom. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> May we read chapter 5 and take it to heart and look in our lives to see where we have bound ourselves in the handcuffs of legalism. Help us to shake off the shackles and live in Christian liberty once again through repentance and forgiveness and through the grace that only you can give. Lord, thank you for the, the chapter that Paul has given us. Help us to study it and take it to heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.